anniversary of Colonel Monmar Gaddafi's 34th year in power. And tonight, he's left the women of Libya in charge of the celebrations. Gaddafi is a survivor who has played many roles. To the West, he was a sponsor of terrorism, but to the region, a champion of Arab and African causes. Tonight, Gaddafi is playing the feminist. Displaying Libya's military hardware at the women's contingent of the People's Army. Also on show are the Virgin Guards, Gaddafi's personal bodyguards. Hundreds of women have turned out to cheer them on. Our Libyan minders direct us to fighter pilot Salima Miskawa. The women in, uh, in Libya, uh, when the, Mr. Gaddafi came, became free. Before the woman, uh, not free, but now the woman is free. Now the woman is a captain, she flying uh, to the airplane, she uh, drive the ship, she, she, uh, she in the army. It is true that compared to other Arab countries, Libyan women share equality in education and marriage. But the real message of the night was left to the man himself. At another venue, Gaddafi announced he was making peace with the West and ending years of international isolation. It was the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, that triggered Libya's isolation and UN sanctions. Libya was blamed for the bomb that killed 270 people. It was one of the most infamous terrorist acts of that decade. To end the sanctions, Gaddafi will pay one of the biggest compensation packages of all time. A total of 10 billion US dollars to the victims' families. Of the draft resolution to the UN, he also had to admit responsibility for the actions of his officials. But to his domestic audience, Gaddafi is defiant. He said the money was not an admission of guilt, but just the price Libya had to pay for entry back into the world community. But in his denial of responsibility for Lockerbie, Gaddafi has found an unlikely ally in Scotland. Professor Robert Black has campaigned for years to bring the Lockerbie perpetrators to justice. He was instrumental in setting up the trial under Scottish law in The Hague that in January 2001 convicted a Libyan intelligence agent. Yes, it is a betrayal, I, I feel. Uh, I... But now, Professor Black thinks Abdel Basset al-Magrahi was wrongly convicted. And it angers me that although the arrangement itself the actual practicalities of the trial work perfectly. It's just that, in my view, the outcome was a wholly and utterly perverse verdict. Professor Black says the main evidence against McGrahi was not only circumstantial, but not credible. 
It centres around the clothes in the suitcase that contain the bomb. It's alleged McGrahi brought them off a shopkeeper in Malta, thus connecting him to the attack. The shopkeeper at no point ever said, that is the man who bought the clothes. The most that he would say is that that man resembles a lot the person who bought the clothes in my shop. And he had also, in his original statement to the police, the shopkeeper had given a description of the man who bought the clothes. That description was that the man was over 50 years old and that he was over six feet tall. Abdul Basit Magrahi, at the relevant date, was 36 years of age, and at that date, and still, he is five feet eight inches tall. Nevertheless, on that evidence, the judges held that Abdul Basit Magrahi was the person who bought the clothes in the shop. Many of the British victims' families agree with Professor Black that the verdict was unreliable. I would like to see Libya allowed to come back into the United Nations. To uncover the truth, the families are calling for a full public inquiry. And Professor Black wants a retrial. And if that doesn't happen, he's prepared to quit the profession. If our legal and judicial system is not strong enough to recognise that it has made a mistake and to take the appropriate action uh, to rectify that mistake, then I'm afraid it is a system with which I do not wish to be connected. Black says he doesn't know who's responsible for the bombing, but says there is other evidence pointing to the radical Palestinian faction, the PFLP General Command and Iran. Gaddafi has always denied that Libya was responsible for Lockerbie, but he's desperate to end Libya's isolation. So desperate that he's willing to pay 10 billion US dollars. Even though we paid money for something that we did not commit, we are paying this to buy a license. Libya needs to be admitted into the world stage, to be looked into as a serious partner that people can do business with. As part of this strategy, Libya is quietly dropping its own compensation claims for America's bombing of Libya in 1986. The Americans accused Libya of state-sponsored terrorism. In the attack, Gaddafi's own adopted daughter was killed, along with 50 other civilians. One of them was Rafat Ghassin, a daughter of Lebanese petroleum engineer Basim Ghassin. Everywhere they were talking about her. She the memories of the night still haunt the family. That's a funeral. Then I tried to get up. I couldn't see anything. I touched the walls of the rooms. There were no doors. So I had to speak to my husband from behind the wall. I told him, Bassam, what happened? Where is Kinda? He said, she is safe. She is under the rubble, but I can feel her. And I can touch her hand. So I went to the other uh, wall where my daughter Rafat was sleeping, I called her by name. She couldn't, she did not answer me. I knew immediately that Rafat passed away. So I told him, Bassam, I think Rafat is gone. She's gone. Their daughter Rafat was a budding artist and was visiting the family on Easter holidays from her English boarding school when she was killed. In one year, she did around uh, 60 pictures. The family wants to know why their home, that was located in an exclusive suburb in Tripoli, was targeted in a raid that the Americans said was an attack on terrorism. Five of their neighbours were also killed. When they speak about terrorism, uh, it really... Uh, surprises me so much 
because all the people who were killed there were so innocent and so good. So what is it? What is it that I would like to know and understand? They have mixed up my head, so I can't really explain things. For 17 years, Basim has lobbied for justice and pursued the case both through American and British courts, but to no avail. The contrast with the Lockerbie victims angers him. Uh, I've been reminded that your daughter is nothing. It has no value. It's just the others, and because they have uh, support and power behind them, they, they can get compensated. In Tripoli, the only memorial to the American raids is this monument. Repeated attempts to interview victims' families were blocked by main Libyan minders. Gaddafi wants to put the past behind him and embrace the future, his new era for Libya. To achieve it, he is preparing to overhaul the system he created. The Lockerbie payout was just one step in a wider plan to liberalise and privatise Libya's economy. It's a radical departure, but it seems Gaddafi doesn't have a choice. Unemployment is running at estimates of 30%, and Libya's population is expanding rapidly. Just to say hello, that's it. The face of reform is the new Prime Minister, Shukri Ghanem. In a country that does not tolerate criticism, he is surprisingly frank about Libya's failures. But uh, as you know, public sector proven to be sluggish, sometimes even corrupt in a way, and then we have to revisit it and uh, revise our policies that at least we give the opportunity to the private sector to play and augment the role of the public sector in economic development. And therefore, The Prime Minister knows he will have to open Libya's economy to the world if Gaddafi's regime is going to survive. And he's thinking big, calling for $60 billion in foreign investment over the next five years. So we just uh, abolished all trade licenses, importation and exportation, and that is, of course, uh, meant that we are integrating in the international uh, market in trade, and even we applied to join the World Trade Organization, and we lodged our application there, and for certain reasons it has now been a little bit delayed, but we are uh, hoping that uh, this uh, application will be looked at uh, pretty soon. For more than three decades, Libya has been ruled by Gaddafi's Green Book and its third universal theory, a blend of socialist and Islamic thought. In theory, Libya is run by the people through popular committees, but in practice, it's a bureaucratic nightmare. At the Green Book Research Centre, where students and academics try to decipher the wise words of their leader, they are now studying Gaddafi's privatisation push. Does this mean that one of the last bastions of anti-Western ideology is faltering and capitalism has won? One of the characteristics of this ideology is that it is evolving, it is dynamic. It lives in constant dialogue with realities, it is dynamic, so its premises are reinterpreted. Yusuf Sawani is also the research director of the centre and says the regime has become pragmatic and has stopped trying to export its revolutionary ideas. There was a contradiction between Libya's national interest and the dictates of ideology. And for most of the time, Libyan politics was, uh, uh, was to be uh, carried out according to the projection of ideology. That meant the neglect of national interest. Libya paid heavy, heavy uh, losses for, uh, for the maintenance of these ideological aims, nationalist aims, pan-Arabist, pan-Islamist, pan-African. The fate of Saddam Hussein also speeded up the process. 
The last thing Gaddafi wants is regime change. The process of rethinking, adjusting, rehabilitating Libya for a policy started very well before the war against Iraq. The war in Iraq consolidated that process and it gave Libya and its leadership a very strong uh, uh, message that that process ought to be consolidated and taken a bit further down the road. When support for radical Arab factions and Arab unity only brought Libya international isolation, Gaddafi turned to Africa. In 1999, he declared his own USA, or United States of Africa. It was a bid for respectability, a chance to promote himself as Africa's elder statesman and satisfy his desire for world influence. This is the fourth anniversary of the African Union and the diplomatic community has turned out to thank Gaddafi. On this historical day, we commend Haile your eminent role and your wise leadership which you guided your brothers, the African leaders, to concretize the dream of unity of our continent. It is a worthy idea, but it too has been an expensive failure. Gaddafi has had to finance the venture and the participation of the poorer African states, even opening up Libya's borders to African guest workers. Libya now has more than a million Africans looking for work. Hundreds of Africans live in this abandoned construction site in Tripoli. Now this is where I sit. Sable Kofi Mafu came from Ghana to make his fortune. To go to the work. So this uh, is my blanket, uh, my mattress. So how many people in this area? We are about seven or eight people here. Uh, Sable was a teacher in Ghana, but now he's lucky to earn three dollars a day shoe shining. Now what I do is I just sit by the roadside when your shoe squares, then I make it for you. That is what I'm doing here. And it's not that there are no schools. There are schools, but because I'm a black man, you know, they wouldn't allow me. Black man stand before them to teach them what they don't know. For all the official rhetoric of African unity and brotherly love, these Africans find it's a different story with the Libyan people. Sometimes when you are going upstairs on the building, they'll be throwing stones at you. And some will even call you a slave. Yeah, we are Western refugees here, so we need help from the Europeans. Europeans and Americans. We are, now we are not saying we are Ghanaians, we are refugees. Because back home, we cannot stay. Here we are not staying, we are suffering. Yeah, I swear God, I don't have nothing. I spent about three years in this country, I don't have nothing. Libyans don't want the Africans to stay. They say they bring crime, AIDS and prostitution. This anger erupted into race riots in October 2000, when nearly 200 Africans were killed and thousands were forced to flee. They started killing the blacks wherever they see. They saw a black man, they had to run after him. If they had him, they would kill him. That was what happened before. Libyans resented Gaddafi's expensive pan-African experiment at a time when they were suffering. It could be explained by the hardships Libya felt during the sanctions. I mean, money became, you know, dearer and job opportunities became less and less available in the Libyan economy because the economy stopped any developing. And, you know, the rate of, of, of uh, uh, development was probably less than 1% uh, during the last 10 years or so. So that brought more pressure on the resources of this country. It's been a blow for Gaddafi's pan-African visions, and these Africans are now stranded. They don't have the money to return home. No. 
Returning home soon is also not an option for the Libyan opposition based in London. Members of the Libyan political forum recognise that reform is underway, but question the motives. What we have been witnessing in the, in the last few months or couple of years is Gaddafi giving a lot of concessions to the outside world, mainly to the West, but not giving any concessions at all to the Libyan people. And our worry is now that because Gaddafi is going to feel more secure with the West, that the West have accepted him, that he has no longer any external threat like the threat that was uh, faced by Saddam. So Gaddafi is going to feel more secure and he's going to be free to be even more oppressive to his own people. Reform must come from the bottom up and it must involve all sections of society. There must be a debate about it beforehand. You know, what are the conditions of, of, of reform? What are the premises? What are the objectives? Are we reforming in order to uh, uh, so support the regime and strengthen the regime's hold on the country? Or are we reforming in order to improve the lot of the whole of the country? While these men lobby for political reform from afar, it's not about to happen soon. Internal dissent to Gaddafi's rule is not tolerated. Uh, same thing with the you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm going to. Unlike many of the regimes that surround Libya, Gaddafi has spent money on his people. The Sharifs are a middle class family living in Tripoli. And it's no surprise, with my minders looking on, that they praise the benefits of Gaddafi's revolution. Libya does have the highest standard of living in Africa. The United Nations lists Libya in the top third of its human development index above Saudi Arabia and Turkey. And the family thinks that now UN sanctions have been finally lifted, that that's set to increase. والله التغير الكبير هو حتصبح فيها فيها يعني تطور في مجال التعليم أكثر مما هو عليه يعني في الوقت الحالي وحتى الجانب الاقتصادي حيزيد يتطور بشكل مهول يعني مش بالشكل الموجود هو تطور حاليا. Oil will be the key to Gaddafi's continued rule. Libya has some of the largest unexplored oil fields in the world, and Gaddafi has recently put them on the market. Foreign oil companies are pleased to see Libya welcome back into the international fold. Now they can get their hands on the oil. We are categorized in the community as the most potential uh, country as far as exploration and new finds. We are maybe the only country that people can find uh, half a billion barrels plus of reserves. And uh, uh, we have a lot of interest uh, from international companies uh, to do business with us. As Iraq falls apart, the oil companies that were hoping to do business after Saddam are now looking at Libya as a more promising and secure source. You will see a stampede in uh, by American companies because the most they are, they know what the, what the opportunities exist in Libya. Gaddafi is now the longest serving Arab leader and the key to his survival has been an ability to reinvent himself. Now the man who had seen himself as a leader of global revolution is seeking redemption from the West. He's holding his rhetorical tongue and brought his ticket back to the world. The removal of Saddam Hussein and Libya's economic isolation have left him with no other option.